Thank you for inviting me in such interesting Congress and uh, discussion. I'm trying to go forward. Okay, let's start from an example of science communication and journals on newspapers. Actually, this is a website, is the Huffington Post, is one of the most uh, well-known uh, mag online magazine in in uh, in Europe and United States. And this is an article, uh, as you can see, the title is Antibiotics Cause Cancer. And let's go on and read a little bit about this story. The author starts with uh, some uh, uh, reasonable premises that antibiotics are being overused. This is something we know, a problem recognized by mainstream medicine. And she refers to the normal friendly bacteria that colonize our body as probiotics probiotics in her text, which is a wrong term, as you know, if you're a doctor. A probiotics refers to product that mean to support the normal bacterial flora in our body, but they are not uh, pro properly bacteria. Then she launches her claims and she says, these healthy bacteria, which should be in abundance in our guts, dine on unhealthy bacteria and yeast in our bodies. And so what she says is that actually, these healthy bacteria form the the basis of our immune system. And she go on and she says, and that can set up um, uh, or anti or if our immune system, or they did until we took antibiotics because antibiotics regularly kill our healthy bacteria. And that can set, up, set you up for no, numerous problems down the road, including some very serious problem. First, an estimated 90% of the population has a problem with candida overgrowth. And she go on saying that uh, there is a, a, a fascinating oncologist in Rome, an Italian one, Dr. Tullio Simoncini, that says that cancer is a fungus and actually an advanced form from candida overgrowth. You can read more in his book Cancer is a Fungus, in which he scientifically explained that the cause of cancer is always and only candida. Because Simoncini is having a great deal of success eliminating cancer in the body, very quickly, I believe he's one to listen to. This was written in a newspaper, actually not an Italian one. Let's go uh, debunking this article. What's wrong in this article? Healthy bacteria are not part of our immune system, but this claim has been used by serious scientists too. We know that bacteria can help our immune system, but they are not strictly speaking part of our immune system. So they are, there is a misuse of terminology. Healthy bacteria do not eat other bacteria or fungus, but it's an ecosystem. It is true that broad spectrum antibiotic used to treat serious infection can also kill some healthy bacteria. Candida actually does colonize about 90% of the population, but it's normal. It's something that uh, we have in our body. And Dr. Simoncini is a notorious cancer quake that, with bizarre claims that have not been demonstrated scientifically, but he published on peer-reviewed journals. So actually, what I'm trying to demonstrate with this article that when we cover the topic of pseudoscience, there is always a core of science in any miraculous treatment. The, what you see here in the picture is a aloe vera uh, plant. We have in Italy a priest that claims to be able to cure cancer with aloe vera extracts, but what you see in the other uh, slide uh, picture uh, up there uh, on the corner is a medline I did on aloe vera, and actually, if you use aloe vera in high concentration in 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 uh, in a lab, you will kill cancer cells. Uh, because also, if you put cancer cells in a in a big uh, uh, bottle of water, you kill them because cancer cells are killed if you put them in water uh, because of osmosis. So actually, uh, it's quite easy to find a core of uh, science in any kind of pseudoscientific claim, and this is a problem for us as a journalist because between this is a cartoon I really like between two choices if you have to cho to decide between an inconvenient truth or a reassuring lie you will always cue on the reassuring lie uh, because what moves uh, patients and readers is is this uh, emotion that is fear okay um, 
how fear interferes with decision making. This is a, a schema, a schema pub published by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention that illustrates the domains that influence evidence-based decision making. And what they say is that the environment and organizational context in which healthcare decisions swim actually encompasses the entire process. There is an overarching culture, including the culture of fear in medicine, that affects each domain. So if we live in a culture of fear uh, toward medicine and we don't provide a clear explanation of what's going on, the decision making is influenced by fear. So what Bernadette O'Keefe, I think this is a very interesting uh, uh, quote that she gave, um, she's an expert in public health at the Mayo Clinic, she claims that it's time to decouple fear from health in science and medicine communication. So when we talk about uh, diseases, we have to explain what's going on and we have to decouple, really separate fear from what our explanation for many reasons. Is this what's happening in newspapers? This is a very interesting experience that has been done by a group of uh, uh, sociologists. It's called Mountains Out of Mole Hills. Mole Hills are uh, big, uh, small mountains built by insects. Um, they collect the number of articles that went out on newspapers in uh, in English uh, uh, during uh, uh, now uh, 18 years. Uh, all the small mountains that you see, the different colors, are different topics that have been covered. Actually, if you look at what are the topics that have been covered, the most important one are in Europe are the SARS and swine flu epidemic. You have, uh, I think, orange. I have different colors in this video. Video, but I think it was, no, sorry, a pink, the pink mountain. And you have Ebola in, in uh, 2014, that is the gray, uh, the gray mountain that you see, the, the, the thin and very high mountain you see there. This is the number of articles that were published on these diseases. But this actually is what we have to, if we reshape it to see all the articles that have been published on Ebola, because if we stick to the other uh, uh, resolution, Ebola is too big to stay into the picture. So actually, we covered a lot Ebola in our newspapers. But is Ebola really a problem for our, for our citizens? This is the same cartoon that was reshaped to, um, uh, to explain what was actually um, the scale by death. So how many people uh, actually died for the different reasons that we covered on newspaper? And you can see that there is no relationship between the fear that we transmitted to our readers and the number of people that died, actually, the, how threatening was this uh, topic in, in newspapers. So if we want to uh, change the culture of fear, we have to think also how much we cover a certain topic. This is because me media are uh, strongly related to what we call cognitive bias. I have no time to explain them, but cognitive bias have been studied by two Nobel Prizes, Daniel Kahneman and Anton Dvergsky, in, in the field of economic decision making. Uh, we, we have some mental shortcut to take decisions that actually help us to be very fast in deciding, but sometimes they are actually very emotionally driven and they don't help us to take rational decisions. One of the most important cognitive bias is what we call the um, confirmation bias. When we have an opinion on something, it's quite different, difficult for us to change our idea. And not only, we also have issues uh, if something is very often presented as threatening to our attention, then we tend to consider it much more threatening than what it is. And actually, you know that we are... We, we are we experience fear toward some decision like taking an airplane, even if we know that it's much more threatening to go by car, uh, because there are much more uh, incidents by car than by airplane. But this is the kind of representation we have of what's going on. So some, some diseases like cancer or cognitive diseases have this aura of threatening that sometimes is not related to the to how threatening they are in reality for the life of the patients we have now some uh, some some cure some some uh, um, therapies that can help patients to live longer than in the past 
Um, so the problem with pseudoscience is that, uh, as this EMBO report uh, uh, that was published in 2017 uh, states, that pseudoscience is not the antithesis of professional science, but thrives in science shadows. So actually, the enemy is among us. There are some problems in science that also relate to the diff diffusion of pseudoscience. Um, and you don't need to be pseudo to be pseudoscience. This is an interesting article that was published a few weeks ago. Uh, one of the author is uh, uh, Ivan Ransky, a science journalist that uh, uh, invented and created the Retraction Watch uh, website that collects all the fraud and anti-scientific, non-scientific publication that actually uh, were published in peer-reviewed journals. They did three randomized controlled tried, uh, trials to evaluate the impact of, of spin in health news stories, um, reporting studies on pharmacological treatments on patients and caregivers' interpretation of treatment uh, uh, benefits. And what they discovered is that if you present the same story, uh, one with the spin and one without the spin, the perception of how ben beneficial the treatment is for the patient is much higher, of course, if you give the same data, but the, let's say, the tone of voice of the article is much more beneficial than what it is in reality. So this is a very important lesson for us as science journalists. We can really influence the way things are perceived even if we cover them in a very strict and very scientific way, even if our data are right, our tone of voice is important. And I think this is also important, an important lesson for doctors. Uh, this is, I, I often cover cancer, and uh, one of the problem I have is that when we have a new discovery on a new pathway, a new target, a new cell, the problem is that I can't uh, have on newspapers a title, we discover the cure for cancer, because this is a problem or we discover even we discover the cure for uh, uh, breast cancer I can't say this so actually what on one of the things that are a common misinterpretation of of communication is that the so-called deficit model that it's uh, enough to explain to your patient or to your readers what's going on what is right so to do the debunking what I did with the first article to solve the problem this is a false premise we have tons and tons of scientific research that says that uh, even if you spend hours explaining what is uh, true and what is not, it's quite hard to change the mind of, uh, of your readers, of your, your society, of your citizens, of your patients. It's not enough because it doesn't rely only on rational decision making. Um, I will go a little bit faster. So one of the problems we have is who is the expert that should talk about the different uh, uh, kind of science and treatments. This is an, uh, a book that was published by some American colleagues a few years ago, and it's exactly on the problem of finding good experts. Uh, you could say, okay, a medical doctor that sticks to science is a good expert, but actually I will show you. This is a very interesting editorial by Daniel O'Krant in uh, 2004. He said that expert actually, he analyzed his uh, journal, he was the editor-in-chief of New York Times, and he analyzed his journal and he said, okay, I think that experts are hazardous for my newspaper. I prefer to take out any, all the opinions from my newspapers and just stick to data, because opi ex expert opinion are misleading for our readers. And the other problem is that sometimes um, uh, the healthcare sector says that journalists are unscrupulous hacks and uh, ill-informed pundits rather than objective communicators of health information so that they foster the public debate in the bad way. And uh, the other problem is that media are in, sorry, this is the wrong one. And the other problem we have as uh, journalists is that we uh, have the issue of covering science as a so sociological phenomenon in, 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 a, in a balanced way, which means that we have to give voice to the different opinions, but this is not uh, easily applicable to medicine. I mean, uh, we, we have an official medicine, and a scientific medicine, and the power uh, of evidence of this medicine is not the same power we have with alternative of pseudoscientific medicines, but we also have the duty to cover pseudoscientific 
pseudoscientific medicine as a sociological phenomenon because as journalists we describe the reality. The problem is to be clear that we are talking on two different levels. On one level we are presenting data, on the other level we are just describing what's going on on a sociological level in our society. Uh, because science communication in the field of medicine is a balance between hype and hope. And uh, let's go back to our sources. Um, if we stick to scientific sources, we also have hype in our scientific sources. This is a, uh, a study on media coverage of scientific me meetings that says that uh, often they are, we, we have press releases that uh, overestimate the results of scientific research that is presented in scientific meetings. It was published by JAMA. And the same, of course, if we stick to press releases from pharmaceutical industries. And uh, again, if we uh, stick to academic press releases, why am I uh, highlighting this? Because any time we, uh, um, uh, we, we um, overestimate the effects of what of a treatment of what medicine can do, we are harming and the trustworthiness, the trustability of uh, the official and scientific medicine because it you only have, it's enough to have one uh, relative that is sick, even if uh, it took uh, the right uh, treatment to discard, to, to, to disrupt all the trust that our citizens have in our medicine, if we claim that this medicine is able to cure something that is not actually. And uh, I think that, and I will end with this uh, a few slides, about the, the fact that as a science communicator, we have to increase uh, the trust in our profession. Those are some uh, uh, data from uh, uh, different uh, uh, surveys in Europe. This one is in the UK. As you see, doctors are very high in trust, 92%, while journalists are very low. We are 26%. Not only I have other one, we are a little bit increasing, but not so much. Those are the trends toward the last years. Uh, uh, so what's the problem with this? Uh, we have also the Edelman Trust Barometer. This is in the US. And we, as you see, we have the same problem. Uh, journalists are not really considered. But let's have a look at this. We, I said that scientists and doctors are very high in the, in the opinion of the public. The problem is that if you ask them, do you trust in your doctor, they say yes. But this is an interesting survey they did in Triple Yes. They asked to scientists what they think about controversial very emotionally driven decisions, uh, decisions that have values behind. They ask them, what do you think? And they ask to the lay people, to the citizen, what, what they think. And have a look at the difference, OK? On, let's say, on, on what they think this was on climate change, but also on vaccine, childhood vaccine. It's good. Childhood vaccine are good for 86% of the doctors, but only 68% of the people. But we said that they trust in their doctors. How is possible this difference? So actually what people trust when you ask them, do you trust in science? They don't trust in science. They believe in a sort of religion of science, that science is good, it's a nice thing. But then when they have to use science to take the decision in their own daily life, uh, things change dramatically. And, and if you keep on asking in the surveys, do you believe your doctor, you will never ever understand why they rely on pseudoscience. And the reason why they rely on pseudoscience is exactly what I tried to mention before, that we need an environment that uh, uh, bring people to reflect about what science is really. We don't have to hype the science when we cover it. We have to be clear on the limits of science. And as doctors, you also have to be very clear on the limits of what you can do and what you can offer to your patient. I can help you to live longer. I can help you to live forever. I can't cure your disease. I can do something for your side effects, but I can't do something for your cancer, unfortunately. Sometimes it happens. And you have to be clear on what is what you can do and what you can't. And the same is for us as journalists. We have have to be clear and uh, on, on what are the limits of science.